Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. Uh, I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Um, we will soon begin our second panel of the day, Macro Benefits of Microgrids, in, in just one moment. Over the course of the rest of the day, we will feature welcome messages from the members of Congress who lead the House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses. We would not be here today with the, without their support um, and without the support of their excellent staff. And to help introduce this panel, it is my privilege to introduce United States Senator Susan Collins from the great state of Maine. Hello, I'm Senator Susan Collins. I'm pleased to welcome you to EESI's 7th Annual Congressional Expo and the first ever virtual expo. As the co-chair of the Senate's Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, it is my pleasure to introduce the next panel, the macro benefits of microgrids. This distinguished panel, which includes the experts from the National Association of Energy Service Companies, New Jersey's Clean Energy Program, and the Electric Power Research Institute, will explore the benefits of this exciting technology. Microgrids are relevant to the many islands located along the more than 3,000 miles of Maine coastlines. Maine's island communities have long had to be creative to obtain electricity, but the power is often costly. Several islands, including Isla Ho, are now looking to microgrids as a way to cut costs and rely less on outside sources for power. Thank you again for joining this expo, and please help me give a warm welcome to the next panel, the macro benefits of microgrids. Great. Thank you so much, Senator Collins, for joining us. Uh, and thanks to your wonderful staff for everything they have done uh, to make today possible. They really couldn't be a nicer group of people to work with. ESI was founded in 1984 to provide nonpartisan information on environmental energy and climate issues to policymakers on Capitol Hill and to the public. We do this in different ways, including by holding briefings, which are all archived online, and writing fact sheets and articles. I encourage everyone to visit us online at www.eesi.org and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. That is really the best way to keep up with all of our work. This next panel is macro benefits of microgrids. These facilities deliver considerable reliability and resilience benefits, not just for the off takers of their energy output, but also the rest of the grid. Resilience in particular is a top priority of EESIs. It has implications for everything from national security to the ability to recover from severe weather events. You will hear about the value proposition of microgrids, which is a lot more complicated than you might guess, as well as how new technologies are making these applications better than ever. Even though we're online, we will still take your questions. Please follow EESI on Twitter at EESI online and send in your questions that way. You can also send an email to EESI at EESI.org. We will draw from your question submissions after we hear from our panelists. Our four panelists today are Joy Ditto of the American Public Power Association, Timothy Unruh of the National Association of Energy Service Companies, Haresh Kamath with the Electric Power Research Institute, and Doug Vine of the Center for Climate and Clean Energy Solutions. For full biographies of our panels, visit www.esi.org. Joy, we're going to kick it off with you. Welcome to the expo, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. Thank you to you and EESI, um, and also, uh, to Becky Blood, a longtime friend of mine who uh, works with you on putting this expo on for helping to include me in this panel. It's, uh, it's a great, an esteemed panel and I appreciate being included. Um, so before I get started, I, I know we have a few minutes for remarks about kind of uh, level setting who we are. Um, I am the president and CEO of APPA. I came back in January after uh, having been president and CEO of a related organization, the Utilities Technology Council. And I'll bring some of that experience um, to bear here today from the, the uh, technology side. But prior to that, I was at APPA for 15 years and then prior to that on Capitol Hill. So 
I've been uh, working on energy and electricity related matters for about 20 years now, but I am not an engineer. And we are joined on this esteemed panel by many engineers who can give you some of the details on um, really the nitty gritty of how this operates. But I see things through sort of a different lens and, um, and we'll also bring the perspective of uh, smaller electric utilities and how we uh, manage microgrids and, and how we've managed them for many years and, and will into the future. So what is APPA? What's public power? Um, APPA is the national organization representing the interests of the approximately 2,000 public power utilities that uh, operate across our nation and in a few territories. We're in 49 states, all but Hawaii, and um, the vast majority of our members are in communities of 10,000 people or less. We do have some larger cities that you'll hear about, but for the most part, we're very small utilities. So in some ways, um, our, our members are, were kind of the original microgrids, meaning back 100 years ago, uh, and even more recently than that, before the bulk power system really became the most economic way of generating and producing and uh, distributing power, we were really on our own in many cases and providing power to our com small community on our own and, and kind of as a microgrid is envisioned. So. Um, that's who we are. We also are, just to be clear, we're not for profit electric utilities. We provide our uh, electricity at cost. We're typically affiliated with municipal governments. We employ about 93,000 people across the country and provide um, electricity to about 2.6 million businesses. So I am a big fan of definitions. And so I'm going to start off, and you may have heard this already if you were participating in the previous panel, but what, what is a microgrid? microgrid? How is it defined? Um, and the Department of Energy defines a microgrid as a group of interconnected loads, so demand, and distributed energy resources within clearly defined electrical boundaries that acts as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. A microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid to enable it to operate in both grid connected and island mode. So it, this also, even though this seems like a simple definition, I think there needs to also be a, a brief understanding of how electricity works. Electricity is produced and consumed instantaneously. While we've made strides in energy storage, and especially in recent years, it's still not ubiquitous, it's still expensive, and it's still maybe not quite as reliable as we'd like it to be um, for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. So um, we need to keep the lights on continuously at every second of every day. So um, I just want to be clear that that's the case in a microgrid situation or outside of a microgrid situation. So on those main islands that Senator Collins was talking about, they're challenged with keeping the lights on in their communities all the time, no matter what they're doing with their generation portfolios. Um, so I, I just will say that um, the ability to, to sort of island and use microgrids is typically, you know, the defining feature of such a grid. You want it to operate on its own. Um, and it's also a system that can manage load or demand and distributed energy resources, such as wind, small wind, solar, um, and you know other types of uh, combined heat and power resources. And and might be um, and may be able to optimize energy efficiency and operations, reliability, and grid services. Um, looking ahead, I think these systems will likely become more complex because we're increasing the usage of sources that are um, intermittent, like wind and solar, again, electricity needs to be produced and consumed instantaneously. So if the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, you have to do something else. Um, so if we can integrate those dynamics in a microgrid, um, that will be really interesting and I think will be very helpful. Um, but there, it requires, frankly, a lot of technology to do that integration. So there's a lot of promise with those types of technologies as we move forward, especially in microgrids, but you still need to balance and manage the, um, those intermittencies and also adding storage in, perhaps adding electric vehicles, other technologies. There's a lot of balancing that needs to occur. And how you balance that is related to, uh, frankly, telecommunications technology. You have to have a network um, that you're able to see those grids and, and turn things off and on instantaneously. And that is enabled by telecommunications technology, 
which allows sensors to go on certain um, certain generation sources so that you can know quickly what's going on and, and bring on other generation sources so that you don't get a blip in your system. So the technology piece is really important and the telecommunications piece that underpins it. So when we're talking about being able to island, um, you also have to contemplate that there's a, there's a communications component that needs to be also be reliable. And so whoever is operating that communications component um, is, is important. Uh, is it the utility? Is it a third party provider like a telecommunications carrier? Also, telecommunications technology has to be energized with electricity. So if the electricity is down, the telecommunications doesn't work. So it's this kind of integrated system. So you have to have backup power for the telecommunication system. So there are some complexities here. I think we're up to the challenge of meeting those complexities. And in public power, uh, in addition to kind of being the original microgrids, as we have moved forward, well, where we see the need is really related to resiliency, which is um, something Dan mentioned already. Uh, so particularly when we serve uh, uh, military facilities, we've, worked, we've long worked with them to make sure that they can continue to function if our grid is down from a storm or some other reason. Um, so we work with them. That's kind of a resilience piece. And there are other um, of our customers who really care tremendously about that resilience piece, not just the military, but others. So we've long worked with them on uh, microgridding their systems. We also um, are, again, looking forward and, and really kind of testing some of these other newer technologies and renewable technologies to, to see if those can work as an integrated system. And much of that that we're doing is almost a uh, research and development and demonstration, kind of that practical application of this technology. And we're often doing that in conjunction with universities, with our research arm, which which is the demonstration, the which is demonstration of energy and efficiency development or DEED. We also work with EPRI, who you'll hear from. Um, so we there's a research and development kind of component to this, a testing, a test bed component, especially with some of these new technologies. And many of our members are again partnering uh, from a funding standpoint with with other groups and also with research and development uh, grant entities like DEED and EPRI to deploy these uh, newer technologies in a microgrid setting. So with that, um, I will give some examples later during the Q&A of some specific places where we are seeing some of these interesting and exciting microgrid, uh, microgrid research and development and, and sort of testing occurring. But with that, I will, um, I will end and turn it back to, to you, Dan, and hopefully looking forward to the to get, get Q&A. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Tim, we're over to you. Thanks, Dan. And, and Joy, I know that you said you weren't an engineer, but I think that I've got an extra I'm an engineer pin somewhere I'm going to send to you because that was a great set of definitions for an engineer. I'm Timothy Unruh. I'm the executive director of the National Association of Energy Service Companies. I am an electrical engineer, and I've worked in the efficiency installation business for about 20 years and also served at the U.S. Department of Energy for eight years, serving as the director of the Federal Energy Management Program, also known as FEMP, and as the deputy assistant secretary of renewable power. I'm also involved in the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers in various standards making processes. So, so today we're here to talk about microgrids. And I think it's wise to state my definition for microgrid before going too far. It will not be as good as Joy's definition. She obviously did her homework better than I did. It wasn't even until recently that my spell checking program even recognized the word microgrid. I always had to put a hyphen in it or override the spell checker to let it have the word microgrid. But to me, a microgrid, like Joy said, is nothing new. Uh, I love the phrase about the original uh, microgrid from American Public Power Association. Uh, as an electrical engineer, I know that small independent grids have been around since the beginning of electrical power. Even before we had integrated utilities, basically all the power was delivered through what you might call a microgrid. So today when we talk about microgrids, I think of a grid or a subset of a grid that has implemented controls that allow the grid to function or perform some additional functionality related to resiliency or efficiency. Note that I, I didn't say reliability, as I think probably all grids are always built for reliability components. Uh, they probably have some resiliency components as well, but I think we're trying to enhance resiliency a lot of times when we're thinking about microgrids. Again, reliability is the ability to keep power flowing. Efficiency is the ability to use the power more effectively. 
and resiliency is the ability to restore power upon its loss. My organization is called the National Association of Energy Service Companies, or simply NASCO. My member companies install energy efficiency retrofits in buildings, and these installations cause substantial savings to occur in what otherwise would have been wasted energy. The monetary amount of those savings, along with operational savings, provide the cash flow stream that can fund the repayment of the investment into energy efficiency in those buildings. Advanced controls on the electrical power system have always been a part of these projects. But there's been a change over the last few years to increase size and sophistication of these microgrids. While early on controls might have implemented such simple things as demand reduction, today the implementation is often coupled with renewable energy and storage to accomplish a resiliency measure. Most of our projects are done with public sector buildings, federal buildings, state, city, county, K-12 schools, universities, and hospitals. These buildings, especially today, are being asked to do functions beyond their original intent from shelters to public meeting spaces, and even today, hospital facilities. Our public buildings are being stretched beyond their original intent, and we've been, we have begun calling them mission-critical facilities as their use has become critical components of fulfilling the mission of our government. A challenge we face with the need for resiliency is funding. While we can implement most efficiency measures through paid for by savings efforts, resiliency, which is closely tied to efficiency, often lacks the expense history to justify a future savings stream. In other words, the changing paradigm of today means we are asking more from our public buildings than we've ever asked in the past. Our buildings are focused on keeping the lights on and keeping the occupants safe. Electrical power is critical for both and microgrids offer the functionality to enhance the system supplied by the utility. As an example, let's consider the microgrid installed at a Marine Corps site in South Carolina. That system has a natural gas fuel combined heat and power plant of about three and a half megawatts, solar photovoltaic of one and a half megawatts that's distributed and four megawatts at a single location. The system also has substantial battery energy storage system. The microgrid in this case allows for high speed controls that can load shed, dispatch generation, batteries and solar to optimize operation, both when connected to the grid and when isolated. This type of system highlights the integration of the efficiency and resiliency needs of the site. Efficiency is supplied by the combined heat and power plant coupled with solar photovoltaic to provide low cost electricity, as well as a source of heat for the site. However, resiliency is supplied by having independent generation and the control of that generation. Coupled with the battery storage, the microgrid allows the site to reduce its operating costs at the same time, improve resiliency. As we look at most projects, we learn that efficiency and resiliency are tied in their implementation. From the simplest look at window replacements to save energy, but then upgrading those same windows to be storm resistant, making the building efficient and resilient at the same time. Microgrids are uniquely positioned to provide the same coupling between efficiency and resiliency. Advanced controls at the microgrid and in the building can coordinate internal loads, on-site supply and external utility availability to result in a location that can withstand power loss and operate efficiently. The future operation of our grid with the inclusion of renewable energy a variable type of power source will inevitably lead to the need for additional load control and on-site generation control to allow our use of the electrical power to match its availability. Great, thanks Tim. Uh, Harash, Harash, welcome to our panel today. Really looking forward, your organization's name has already been taken in vain. Looking forward to what you have to add to our conversation today. Great, thanks Dan. Um, we really appreciate uh, having an opportunity to be on this panel uh, along with these uh, uh, very distinguished speakers. Uh, I'm uh, Harish Kamath, as, as uh, Dan said earlier. I lead the research area for DER integration and uh, energy storage at EPRI. Uh, EPRI, uh, if you're familiar with us, we're at the Electric Power Research Institute. We do public interest research in uh, energy and the environment. Uh, we are primarily a technical organization. Uh, however, today I'm not going to go deep into the technology. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think that uh, uh, Joy and Tim have defined the microgrid very well. Uh, so I'm going to focus my uh, discussion here a little bit on why microgrids make sense right now and why things are, are changing. Uh, microgrids are not new. They've been around for quite some time, actually. Uh, but most of the microgrids that we've seen in the past have been based on distributed generation uh, that are, that's based on, for example, uh, natural gas or gasoline. Uh, or, or you know, other types of liquid fuels or gaseous fuels. 
Now what we're seeing is the possibility of creating microgrids from uh, solar and storage and uh, other new technologies that are much cleaner than uh, what we've seen in the past and uh, which make much more sense from a economic perspective. So to start out, we have to say, why are we seeing uh, so much deployment of distributed solar and storage? Uh, most of it is driven by uh, a number of different uh, drivers, uh, bill reduction, of course, uh, you know, there's tremendous interest in uh, lowering bills uh, from the customer side. Uh, response to, uh, and a lot of that is response to renewable incentives, uh, as well as a commitment to renewable generation. Uh, we have uh, people who are very interested these days in controlling their own generation, primarily because of their commitment. Uh, and that's not just on the personal side, that's also on the corporate side. Many companies are seeking to reduce their carbon footprint or become net zero carbon. Uh, and, a, and a way that they see of doing that is install their own solar resources uh, and um, even using storage on site to uh, increase the amount of energy that they get uh, from their solar that they can use locally. All of this has been made possible through better technology, which has lowered costs substantially over the last decade. Uh, and, it's, and as you know, it's, it's been a lot about solar, but more recently, it's been a lot about storage. And that raises some very interesting possibilities uh, for microgrids. So a lot of people don't know that uh, just because you have solar doesn't mean that you can maintain your power in an outage. Uh, your, a lot of solar systems are designed to operate only when the grid is online. And so if, you're, if you don't have a grid, then your solar system may not be able to give you uh, your, your power during an outage. Uh, that you can fix by having storage on site. And so the solar plus the storage system uh, can create something uh, that uh, gives you local power. And that's what many people call a microgrid. Uh, if we have uh, some capabilities to link up neighboring uh, buildings and installations, then you can expand the boundaries of that microgrid to incorporate um, more than one customer, a, a number of customers. So what we're really seeing is the capability of maintaining resiliency, uh, being able to get back on the grid, get back on power uh, a lot sooner than you would normally be able to do because of the existence of solar plus storage. In addition to that, uh, having microgrids and actually creating, having systems to control these microgrids uh, can actually improve the integration of these renewable resources by allowing us to control them better and orchestrate the way they deliver energy and ultimately uh, help us make better use of the energy that uh, is being delivered uh, from uh, distributed solar. And finally, we can even think of using these solar and storage systems to uh, operate even during those times when the grid is not uh, is, is still up, the 99.999% of the time that the grid is still uh, uh, out there delivering power. Uh, these systems can actually deliver services back to the grid, and that's uh, a very powerful potential for the future. Uh, that said, you know, we have to remember that adopting microgrids, there are some technical challenges to it. It is more than just simply installing solar plus storage. It involves installing controllers that let us orchestrate uh, all of this equipment out there and be able to control it in a way that maintains the level of uh, reliability that we're coming to, that we've come to expect from the grid. We've done a lot of feasibility studies to look at this, to see what's required out there and to see if it makes economic sense. Uh, and I'll point out that even today, even with all the cost reduction that we've seen, a lot of these microgrids are not immediately evident uh, as a economic option. They, they don't necessarily make sense when you, when you, uh, when you look at the, the numbers. Uh, that's today. The cost continues to fall, and uh, as, the, as the costs fall, we will see increased adoption of, of uh, microgrids for resiliency purposes. And I want to point out that resiliency is a very hard number. It's a very hard thing to put value on. There are many people out there who value resilience very, very greatly. So it doesn't have to make economic sense from the basis of energy. A lot of people are going to install microgrids anyway. And as we see those that installation, just as we saw a lot of installation of solar, long before it made sense uh, to, to put solar on just from a purely economic perspective. So don't be fooled by a lot of the folks out there who will, who will say, well, you know, this stuff doesn't really make sense. The grid's out there and it's, it's, very, um, and it's very reliable. All of that is true. But the fact of the matter is that there are many customers who are willing to pay substantially more than the price of energy that they've got right now to make these microgrids possible. And these microgrids are not always going to be more expensive than, uh, than our conventional energy choices. This is a really important uh, thing to consider when we're looking at adoption. 
Uh, this is especially true in a world where we have an increased incidence of natural disasters that can take out the grid uh, and uh, an increased reliance simultaneously on electricity. So there's incredible interest in actually deploying microgrids for these purposes, and we will have to work to accommodate these microgrids into the existing planning and operations uh, pathways of the grid. Uh, there's still a lot of work to make this happen. Uh, there are still a lot of a lot of technical uh, challenges that have that are uh, out there that we have to try to address. Uh, there's a substantial amount of work that uh, we're doing at Equity in, in collaboration with our partners, with APPA, as Joyce said earlier, uh, with uh, organizations like uh, DOE, uh, which is uh, funding a great deal of research in uh, uh, microgrids and in the microgrid-related uh, uh, technologies through the national labs. Uh, there's also a lot of work happening at the uh, utilities in uh, America. who are always trying to... Uh, maintain a high level of reliability for their ratepayers uh, and for the customers of electricity here in the US. Uh, in short, it's a very exciting time uh, for microgrids and for resilience. Uh, this is a technology with a lot of potential for the future, something that we're going to see uh, increased adoption of uh, as, uh, as time goes by. And uh, we're very excited to be a part of this, uh, a part of this mission. That's great, thanks so much. And Doug? Um, really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and thanks to EESI for hosting this event and for the opportunity to speak here. Um, quickly, for those of you that are not familiar with the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions or just C2ES, uh, we are an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that's been around for, oh, about 22 years now. So uh, our mission is to forge practical solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, expand clean energy, and strengthen resilience to climate impacts. And I think that's a pretty good segue into this topic of microgrids, because just as C2ES is looking to mitigate carbon emissions and strengthen resilience, uh, as the other panelists have noted, microgrids can do both. So we've been seeing power sector emissions in the US, they've been falling over the past 10 or 15 years, uh, generally, uh, is the trend, we're on a downward trend, and we continue to look for strategies to build on that momentum. Scientists tell us that we're going to need to make even deeper reductions in emissions in the coming decades in order to avoid the, uh, the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, and at the same time, we also know that climate change is here and now. Uh, we're already seeing the effects of a changing climate in terms of things like sea level rise, uh, more frequent downpour events, and intense storms. So C2ES is interested in both the mitigation and the adaptation attributes of microgrids and other forms of distributed generation. Uh, so as uh, several of the panelists, I believe all of the panelists have already mentioned microgrids have been around for a long time. But I think in uh, presently, our, our microgrids sort of, they had their aha moment about eight years ago in October 2012, when uh, Hurricane Sandy cut off power for many days to millions of homes and businesses in the Northeast and a few areas, uh, mostly parts of universities, uh, a few other microgrids kept the lights on using their own islanded power generation systems. And this ability to, to sustain electricity during uh, widespread natural disasters is uh, probably the primary reason for, for the growing interest in, in microgrids today. So historically, microgrids, they, they have, in the past, they've used combined heat and power and reciprocating uh, engine generators, which rely uh, primarily on fossil fuels. Uh, but as some of the other panelists have pointed out, they, as microgrids uh, are, new microgrids are becoming greener and they're able to incorporate more solar power, energy storage, and other clean energies, clean energy technologies. So specifically, microgrids, they can reduce greenhouse gas emissions in two ways, at least two ways. Uh, they offer the opportunity to, de to deploy more zero emission electricity sources within the microgrid itself. So we had a good definition of a microgrid from Joy. 
so I don't need to reiterate that, but uh, a microgrid can balance generation from the uh, intermittent renewable power sources, small wind or, or solar with, with its dispatchable, say natural gas fired generation. Uh, and additionally, as the price of storage has come down, they can also use energy storage to balance production and usage within the microgrid. Uh, the amount of renewables that can be deployed in a microgrid will be highly dependent on the setting. So whether it's an urban, suburban, or a rural uh, microgrid, the particular geography, and the climate uh, of the microgrid. The second way that microgrids reduce greenhouse gases is by making use of energy that would otherwise be lost. So since microgrid electricity is generated adjacent or very close to where it will be used, uh, line losses are minimized, so not as much electric power loss, uh, and, and less power is required to meet an equivalent level of demand. So when the electricity is generated from certain centralized power sources, a, a large uh, centralized natural gas or coal plant uh, or a large nuclear power plant, uh, they generate a lot of heat, but typically that heat is wasted, it, go, it goes unused up the, up the smokestack. But when you generate the power close to end users, then it becomes economically feasible to use this heat energy productively. So we need to take advantage of all of the potential attributes that microgrids have in order to improve the value, value pop proposition. So we can use this heat productively for heating water or space in nearby homes and businesses. Uh, therefore, we need less fuel to be combusted overall, uh, so we achieve lower greenhouse gas emissions. So in addition to the, uh, the mitigation of emissions, microgrids also have the, their grid resilience uh, attributes. So I mentioned earlier that microgrids can continue to power uh, and can continue to provide electric service during and soon after e extreme weather events like hurricanes. Uh, they also can, uh, Haresh mentioned this as well, they can also help the macrogrid recover from a system outage, either indirectly by sustaining services needed by restoration crews or directly by helping to re-energize the macrogrid. A uh, great example of a uh, microgrid is the one that's located about a dozen miles from the U.S. Capitol in White Oak, Maryland. It's one of the larger uh, microgrids, the Food and Drug Administration Federal Research Center microgrid. It has resilient, an inherent resilience and reliability value to the FDA. So there is a tangible monetary loss to the organization if its scientific experiments are ruined due to a loss of power and climate control. So uh, there have been several instances where the surrounding macro grid went dark. There we had a, uh, famously, we had a 2011 earthquake in the D DC area. There was a 2012 uh, derecho event. I mentioned Hurricane Sandy. Uh, there've been other hurricanes and other storms. And the FDA's microgrid has been remarkably reliable and resilient, and it's remained online through all of those events. Um, the, the microgrid does incorporate some, some solar power as well, and it's, it's projected that it prevents about 72,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide uh, equivalent emissions per year. And it does help the supporting uh, surrounding macro grid. It provides ancillary services, which is another uh, way that microgrids can find value and get an additional revenue stream for themselves. Uh, so utilities have found that microgrids can be, be helpful for them, particular, particularly in instances of where there are remote power locations. A uh, very famous example is in Borrego Springs, California. Uh, it's kind of the end of the line uh, town on the, you know, on the edge of the uh, metropolitan area. And they have a mixed ownership microgrid there that provides clean, reliable, and resilient backup power, power um, not backup power, uh, co cost-effectively in, in that hard to serve uh, isolated community. So I want to draw your attention to three papers that C2ES has done on microgrids. 
So the easiest way to find them is just Google C2ES and microgrids, and I think you'll see all three of them. There, we also have a video that is uh, very good on, of an event that we had uh, in conjunction with George Washington University. And you can also listen to a webinar that we had uh, a, a couple of years ago on microgrids. So I want to talk just a little bit quickly about a couple of the challenges facing microgrids. And this is from one of those three papers. Uh, yeah, I've mentioned all of the um, the microgrids, they, they currently provide just a, a tiny fraction of U.S. electricity, but their capacity is expected to grow significantly. Uh, I mentioned that their, the interest in microgrids is their ability to improve resilience and reliability, increase efficiency, better manage electricity supply and demand, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as, as an aside, there was just a recent Wood McKenzie report that came out that, that noted that four, 546 microgrid projects were completed in 2019, and that's a record number. 86% uh, of those microgrids were fossil fuel based, but they do project uh, in their five year forecast that solar, wind, hydropower, and energy storage will grow to account for 35% of annually installed electric or annually installed capacity by 2025. So in the near term, we're going to start to see a lot more renewables incorporated in planned microgrids. So microgrids, they, they are unique. They're a unique combination of a power source. Uh, they have unique customers, geography, and, uh, the, and they each have a unique market that they're serving as well. So it, it does make financing these projects a challenge. So doing financial feasibility studies and simulation modeling, uh, having public-private partnerships, they could all play a growing role in overcoming some of these financial hurdles. States can play a key role in facilitating microgrid developments. Uh, some states have created funding opportunities for microgrids, and these can be extremely helpful in, um, for planning feasibility studies, for example. But there are, there are challenges uh, that states lack a legal definition of microgrid. And there are regulatory and legal challenges that, that can differ uh, between and within states. So states can assist projects by providing funding grants or low cost loans to perform these, these feasibility studies that I mentioned or to aid in demonstration and commercialization. So we need a, we need a clear legal framework uh, on how to define a microgrid and set forth the rights and obligations of a microgrid owner. So it's easier, say, for a utility uh, to put a microgrid in place as they're sort of the franchise owner, but it, it might be more challenging for another entity that wants to uh, employ a microgrid. So we need to address some of these issues, uh, including rules and costs for connecting to the macrogrid and microgrid developers access to reasonably priced backup, backup power, also known as standby service, and to wholesale power markets to sell excess electricity or other services. So there are uh, programming models that can help project developers in, the, in all phases of, of development as well. Um, so we need to, to develop supportive frameworks and policies. It's gonna be vital to promote greater dialogue among the finance community, service providers and implementers, government officials at all levels, regulatory agencies, and, and other stakeholders. So I think I've probably gone a bit over my time, and just I'll just say thanks at this point, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Doug. And thanks to the other panelists. Uh, we are going to transition now to questions and answers and have a discussion for the next 15 or so minutes. So really looking forward to that. Um, the first uh, and uh, just a quick reminder, if you have questions and there are many, many of you online watching. Right now, so Thank you for that. Uh, if you have questions, there are two great ways that you can send them to us. One is by following us online. Twitter at ESI online. You could also send us an email, ESI at ESI.org, if you would like to um, ask a question of our panelists. Our first question, I'd like to, um, I was going to ask about the definition, but Joy took care of that, and we may want to find a way to get, like, maybe we'll get up, like, embroidered microgrid pillows where we can have the definition emblazoned on it or something, but 
Uh, my, my first question, and this is something that Doug talked about, is this value proposition idea. Um, at various points in your presentations, you talked about how microgrids are not necessarily or easily evaluated in terms of cost effectiveness. And to me, as someone who's worked in financing for a while, that means that there must be other co-benefits. And um, Joy, I'd like to start with you and ask for some additional commentary uh, and maybe some examples from the field about where applications were able to be installed maybe where these co-benefits added up to a degree where it made the value proposition for the microgrid. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what goes into that decision. Absolutely, thank you. Um, can you guys hear me? We good? Okay. Um, so uh, thanks for, for that question. And, and affordability, actually, if, if I didn't make it clear earlier, is a huge component of what we do as public power. We are not for profit. So we're really, our mantra is affordable, reliable, safe and then environmentally sustainable power so we do have to make that um you know that argument to our communities if we are investing in a potentially more expensive technology uh, i also want to make it clear that uh, by 2024 um, we've estimated that about 320 megawatts of energy are going to be deployed by only by public power in microgrid technology and microgrids so uh, that's significant given we're only 15 percent of the electricity mix in the country so we're certainly doing this so nothing i'm about to say is is a reason not to deploy microgrids but you definitely have to bring those value propositions forward you heard from doug about and and, and harash about the clean energy component and so if you're if you're looking at microgrids that uh, incorporate solar and storage and other cleaner um, energy sources i think that could be a component that um, could be looked at to be viewed as a um, sort of a balance to potentially a more expensive investment also in the city of cleveland um, our our cleveland member there has been extremely focused on kind of the resilience component and and we talked about that already a lot but it can't be really um, overstated and so they are, um, they've issued a request for proposal um, about a microgrid in downtown Cleveland. And there's also, you remember too, this does require infrastructure. So there's this sort of potential for pushback on kind of the NIMBY side, right? So it's not just the affordability, but it's also what does that infrastructure look like? So if we're looking at a microgrid in downtown Cleveland, you really have to justify it. And, and they have really been looking at kind of valuing power resiliency. Um, so cost savings coming from uh, reduced capacity, uh, demand and transmission fees, you know, are to lower business interruption and insurance premiums, right? So those are a few of the areas where on the resilience side you can justify. And I think there's some, some well-known areas that maybe the rest of the panel can talk about in terms of uh, quantifying the, the reduction in greenhouse gases and other um, environmental, environmental benefits that could come from microgrids. So with that, I'll turn it back. Thanks, Tim. And Tim, as your member companies, um, their business is dependent in some ways about the, helping to find this value proposition and making the numbers add up. What are some of the what are some of the key co benefits that when your when your members are working, say, with a, a public facility, um, how do they make the economics work out for their customers? Well, the challenge we have with uh, microgrids today is is adding any of the resiliency components, not just a microgrid, uh, means that we're asking our facility to do something that we probably did not expect it to do in the past. And so we have a paradigm shift in that, and that we're asking something in the future to happen that in many ways we don't have a savings or a cost history in the past to justify the expense. And so what that means is it's a new expense. It requires investment. It requires something to be put forth uh, in addition to uh, whatever whatever cost you plan to make that happen. Uh, you know, the cost justification, of course, of the, the resiliency is we, we often don't understand the true cost of that. And so we're still challenged today with defining those costs. We can talk about uh, power losses, but the reality is, is most of our utility systems have been pretty reliable. And so it really comes into the ability to do things like demand shifting and integration of renewable assets. And when you integrate those renewable assets, as uh, several speakers have talked about, the, the variable nature of that load needs some sort of a support structure. Fortunately, I, you know, I see the future that we have a whole integrated load source system and the microgrids will play a central role in negotiating the, the fact that our loads have been variable for years, our, our sources are now becoming variable, 
now we have to start matching those two up. And I think the micro group play a key role in that. Great, thanks. Um, Harash, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, but we just got a question in from our online audience asking us if we could talk a little bit about what the economic benefits of a demand response application or uh, capacity or capability at a microgrid. And um, that, I think that's something that you and, and perhaps also Doug uh, would have an would have something nice to say about. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, demand response, I think, is going to be an important part of what we do with uh, even with microgridding approaches. Uh, having some ability to control the loads uh, will, can ensure us, you know, that we have enough power uh, on a given microgrid to uh, power all the critical loads. And that's really where we're starting with a lot of these, uh, uh, with these resiliency efforts. Uh, we'd like to start with those critical loads, manage other loads uh, as much as we can so that uh, uh, people all get a chance to get their, their power. Uh, and then, um, you know, gradually as, as uh, time goes by, we, we expect that distributed generation will get stronger uh, enough that it will, you know, sustain all loads. Uh, and, you know, increasingly we're already talking about microgrids that are basically a whole power uh, resources. Nevertheless, I think, uh, uh, you know, having a certain amount of load control gives you substantially more reliability on a microgrid when you're actually operating it. Uh, because, uh, you know, one of the reasons that the, that the grid itself is so stable is because it's so massive uh, and there's so much, uh, uh, you know, simply, uh, you know, aggregated loads and aggregated supply uh, that uh, small fluctuations don't actually matter. When you have a smaller grid, uh, it really helps to have some ability on both the supply side and the demand side uh, so that uh, you can maintain a, a very high degree of reliability in, in the grid. So load control is going to be an essential part of, uh, of how we implement microgrids in the future. Thanks. And D Doug, I think I'm really interested in how you would uh, give us a little bit more information about, you, about the proposition. Also, if you have any thoughts about how that value proposition might continue to evolve over time, and maybe there are some applications today that maybe won't quite pencil out, but, you know, maybe five to ten years into the future, we'll start to see more, the, more of these installations pop up. Yeah, so on the question of the demand response, I, I think that's a really interesting one, and that's something where modeling tools can really, really help. Uh, and and the sophistication of microgrid managers that are basically balancing the uh, the supply and demand within the microgrid are, are, are important. Um, so a, a micro, it might not make sense at some points for the microgrid to even be generating its own, its own power. Uh, if it's interconnected, it might, it's common point of coupling, it may have more than one. Um, it, it may be, make much more sense for it to be getting power from the grid at, at certain points in time. So I think, you know, the level of sophistication, that's one of the things about microgrids that's really has been evolving uh, in recent times. Is that we'll get, it's getting a lot more sophisticated in how these, these microgrids are managed. So that's going to optimize the amount of emissions. It's going to give consumers the lowest costs um, that are uh, under the umbrella of this, this particular microgrid. I think, you know, but every micro, one of the things that we heard when, when we were doing research back uh, a, a couple of years ago on this topic is if, if, if you've seen one microgrid, you've seen one microgrid. So they are all, they are all different and they all, they all have a unique uh, set of generation sources. They have a unique uh, market that they are uh, having to adapt to. So it's, it's up to the, the developers, the microgrid owner, to look for all of the various value propositions. And I mentioned heat being, being one that, that's very important. Um, scale is another, another that, that, that's quite important. I think the trend last year at least had been toward much smaller microgrids, but larger microgrids probably make uh, a bit more sense in terms of penciling out economically. Uh, you, uh, we know that some renewables have come down a lot, in our, particularly solar panels is, is what I have in mind. So the, to the maximum extent that you can incorporate solar, if you're in a city location, you might be a little hamstrung in terms of the amount of solar that you can uh, feasibly incorporate. But if you're in a, 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 an urban more, or a more rural setting, you can incorporate more, more solar and reduce your costs, your system costs. Uh, and a cleaner grid. So there, are, it's each situation requires uh, a lot of a lot of forethought. 
Sure. Thanks. Um, we have a few minutes left, and um, I'm going to make this one sort of a free for all. So please speak up if you have a reply to it. Um, one thing we haven't talked much. We've talked about renewables. Um, we've we've talked about storage, but we haven't talked quite as much about electric vehicles. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how um, microgrid deployments, uh, how that will be affected by the deployment of electric vehicles, which are forms of energy storage and um, you know, which will, um, I assume, um, continue or increase in, um, in number and, uh, and variety. I'll, I'll yeah, jump go in ahead. on that. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Joy. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say, uh, just to kind of keep quickly key off of what Doug was talking about in terms of each microgrid being in sort of an individual entity. And I think that really mirrors how we are in, in public power we're locally controlled and so we make decisions based on those local circumstances. And one example of your question, uh, Dan, about electric vehicles is we have, um, especially in Washington State, with a member the Homish County Public Utility District, which is right outside of Seattle, kind of like if Fairfax had its own electric utility. And they uh, are using a $3.5 million grant from the Washington Clean Energy Fund to invest a total of $12 million in their Arlington Microgrid and Clean Energy Center project. It's going to include a 500 kilowatt solar array with smart inverters, a 1000 kilowatt lithium ion battery storage system, and several vehicle to grid charging stations for use with their electric fleet vehicles. So I think you could have seen all these sort of happen individually and not be integrated, but the, the idea of integrating this into one campus, I think is really exciting. And, and I think that's uh, something I can definitely see in the future even more being even more important with microgrids. So it certainly it's something that we support and, um, and look forward to uh, exploring more. Good, thanks. Uh, Haresh, it sounded like you might have another, you might actually have our last comment of the day given the time. So um, let's sure. hear what you think about uh, it. I'll, I'll make it brief. You know, we, we think uh, you know electric vehicles are a huge opportunity for uh, resiliency, uh, and, and particularly for micro in, in as a component of the microgrids. And, and, and we actually talk about four components. You know, whenever we when we talk about microgrids, we say uh, you know solar and storage, and then electric vehicles and and uh, load management. So uh, electric vehicles are, are kind of an in between there because uh, their primary function is not to power the grid. Uh, their primary function is to uh, take you from one place to another, but when they're connected to the grid, they are a formidable resource because they tend to be uh, fairly large in terms of their uh, both their power, uh, potentially their load, but also uh, the capability of putting power back on the grid. Uh, as a result, I mean, you can't ignore that when you look at opportunities for trying to reduce your uh, your, your total uh, resource uh, in, in, able, in, in being able to provide resilience to customers. Great, thanks. Um, we got another online question. We're not going to have time to answer it, unfortunately, but Doug mentioned this, and I think this is responsive to our question. Um, if you are looking for more research and analysis of these, um, I would Google microgrids and APPA and NASCO and EPRI and C2ES. Um, all of these organizations have put a lot of time and thought uh, into this. Sorry, we're not able to get to your question. Um, but thank you, Joy, Tim, Harek, and Doug. This was a great panel and uh, learned a lot about sort of this exciting technology that's, you know, sometimes what's old is new again. And uh, I think maybe this is one good example. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, that is going to conclude the second panel of the day. Um, if you have a few moments, uh, we would love it if you helped us out by taking our survey and providing us uh, some feedback and comments about what you thought about um, this panel and the expo overall. Uh, we really do read that feedback and we do try to take it to heart and, and find new ways uh, to improve, but also the kinds of information that we want to deliver to our policy making and public audience. Um, we are going to start up the next panel in five minutes at noon. Um, just so that everyone knows, um, the platform that we're using today, if you would like to stay on and watch the next panel, you'll have to refresh your browser. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully that's not a problem for anyone. The next panel is a special panel about environmental justice and advancing climate solutions through environmental justice. Um, but if you would like to, um, just staying on this feed isn't going to let you do that. You're going to need to refresh your browser. We'll go ahead and end it there. And I just wanted to say thanks again to our panelists, Joy, Tim, Haresh, and Doug and hope to see everyone back in about five minutes for advancing climate solutions through environmental justice. Thank you so much.